Hey folks, we're CTF Radio here. I'm Adam D, and I have with me as always Zardis. Zardis, why don't you say hi to the folks? Hello everybody, Zardis here. Nice to talk to everyone, and today we have a very fun episode of CTF Radio. Um, we have with us one of the, not just a member of the Order of the Overflow, but one of the founding members of the Order of the Overflow that was one of the people that was there who helped uh, Jan and I actually really start this whole notion. So before we introduce our fabulous mystery guest, Jan, can you maybe talk a little bit about how we, we've talked about a bit in the past about what the order is and what the order of the overflow is, but can you tell us about how that started and what that process was like when we were first you know, deciding to dip our toes in the water of hosting DEF CON CTF? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was uh, definitely a wild, uh, crazy decision um, that was... Uh, definitely not regretted by anyone. <laughs> yeah, and not, not for a moment. Um, so uh, we mentioned in the past uh, the kind of structure of DEF CON, of um, C the CTF scene in general, and, and the reality of DEF CON is it's, it's a huge amount of work, and any large, you know, global uh, prominent CTF a large amount of work to organize and run and mm -hmm. and uh, make awesome. So uh, people have a limited amount of kind of steam. They, they run out of steam after a couple of years and and retire. The organizers of DEF CON CTF tend to retire every four to five years and uh, new organizers step up to take their mm -hmm. place. So when the previous organizers, uh, Legit BS, were stepping down, there was a call for, for organizers by DEF CON conference. And uh, we had been playing CTF um, by that point uh, for, 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 you know, cumulative centuries or something, right, uh, among us. And Just us. terrible, scary math to do. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Uh, and we figured, you know what? Why not throw our hat in the ring? Uh, we were passionate about the CTF community, passionate about um, what CTF... Uh, shows um, means as cybersecurity education mm -hmm. as uh, the uh, showcasing of the very peak of hacker performance and 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 as um, a um, awesome place to to really learn about the cutting edge of security and so we uh, decided to um, write the proposal uh, to be organizers and 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 we you know. At first, I walked into your office, right, Adam? And I said, yes. we should do this. And he said, are you insane? <laughs> I think that's the exact words I said. Exactly. And, and I, I don't like, know oh, that my opinion has changed, perfectly yeah, honest. You just convinced exactly. me of your insanity, and I've exactly. taken it on myself. And then, and then, and then actually, at some point, I talked to Kral, uh, our, our guest, uh, that, that we'll introduce in a second. And uh, I said, um, you know, and, and, and he said something... He was actually very enthusiastic about it at the time. I mean, he's run CTFs. That, well, since, you know, since you're talking about him, let's bring him in so he can tell uh, his point of view. So, uh, yeah, we have with us today Jeff. Jeff, why don't you say hi to the people? Hi. Hey, Great folks. to be here. Great. Hey, Jeff. Awesome. So, yeah, so the now, okay, so let's. Let, let me set the stage for, for Yes, for okay, Jeff set the stage, the please, please. All right. Jeff was working in a bakery at the time, uh, specializing in bread. Oh, He's a nice. bread pro. Um, and uh, he also was a very passionate CTF uh, aficionado. And mm -hmm. so, Jeff, why don't you tell us about, you know, what went through your mind when you saw that call for uh, organizers? So I was very excited about it. I had been running a CTF, um, the Boston Key Party, since I think 2013 was the first year that I ran that. And there was a group of maybe four or five of us running that from 2013 until I think 2017 was the last year of that and the first year that um, that we started running the DEF CON CTF. Um, for three years prior, uh, Boston Key Party had been a pre-qualifier for DEF CON. So I thought it was sort of like a, a natural progression to go from running something that was a pre-qualifier to this, to this big event to like actually running the, the full thing. Right. Um, in terms of like amount of preparation that you have to do and <laughs> amount of, uh, amount of effort that it takes, it was completely mind blowing the difference between 
running a single online Jeopardy event once a year to running an online Jeopardy event and an in-person attack defense event because they're the the amount of of uh, testing and preparation that you need to do is is absolutely crazy in comparison. Yeah, maybe in the future we can talk about how you used to uh, host those infrastructure and how that's changed significantly <laughs> in the uh, hosting attack defense ETFs. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, got kind of to to uh, keep that story uh, rolling forward. Um, so Jeff was a but as as, as he just mentioned, uh, it's quite a lot of, of work and then eventually it started dawning on me that you know the amount of work that 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 this will represent and at some point i showed up to uh like adam's house and that's adam we can't do this <laughs> what are we thinking yeah so at that point you would basically convinced me you'd been i was like okay yeah well let's see what jeff thinks and actually at the time i didn't even know jeff i knew of him and his uh you know standing in the community and I'd been a proud player in Boston Key Party, probably one of the first ones too. Um, and so, you know, I, his reputation certainly preceded him. So at that point I was like, yeah, if Jeff thinks it's a good idea, then sure, like I'm aboard, why not? Like what, what could be the harm of just submitting this uh, proposal? So then Jan shows up to my house, it's probably like seven or 8 p.m. cause it was definitely towards the nighttime mm -hmm. of things. And so you come in and then what do you tell me? I think, man. I, I, I think, uh, you know, everyone's right. This is going to be a huge amount of work. Uh, it, we're not going to be able to, like, like sleep for the whole summer or see our families or, you know, et cetera. So uh, maybe we shouldn't do it. Exactly. And so at that point, then I had to then regurgitate all of Jan's enthusiasm <laughs> back at him and reconvince him that this was a good idea. See, there are several points in this story where we could have not done this and we wouldn't be in this situation. Exactly. But at that point, I was hooked. And I'm like, hey, you know what? It's a big deal. I think we can do it. I think we can build a great team. And yeah, it's going to be a ton of work. Did I know how much work it was going to be? No, absolutely not. I think if anyone, if anybody knew the full depth, they just wouldn't do it, right? And yeah, yeah, like, absolutely. like uh, Jeff said, so... Um, so uh, was that the night we wrote the proposal? Yep. Uh, so we sat down and we had, uh, you know, we had the, the general ideas um, mm -hmm. behind the proposal and what we wanted to accomplish as organizers. And, and much of that proposal is on overflow.io as our philosophy page. Mm -hmm. um, and so we sat down. Um, and this was also the second time that I'd ever written any LaTeX, so it was <laughs> <laughs> I forgot it was a LaTeX document. Yeah, that's our, uh, you know, we're academics. That's our bread and butter. If I'm going to make a doc, I'm going to make it look pretty, and it's going to be in LaTeX, baby. Yeah. And I don't remember. Did, did you get it to uh, compiler, or were you just pushing text, and then someone would make sure? I was just pushing text because I didn't have a compiler right. installed. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, you forgot the main reason that fueled our proposal writing uh, phase there, Jan. The main, the main reason for that phase was uh, uh, Adam's very um, expansive whiskey collection. Yeah. There's so he a, came over. Uh, we started. I'm like, well, if we're going to write this, let's do it. And so poured us some whiskey and brought out some more whiskey. And I'm yep. fairly certain your wife had to pick you up after that. Uh, yep. 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 That, it that was, uh, was one of those, you know, I, I mean you have like on the counter like this whole like array of whiskey by the end you know and this one is smoky and this one is like i think we'll i did yeah we had a whiskey and, tasting and so that's right yeah, yeah. This, so. this one's good at ponables or, <laughs> or good for ponables <laughs> yeah depending on what you want to do so yeah that's the birth of the order jeff was right there uh one of the midwives or moms or dads or however you want to phrase that i think is uh, jeff was right there from the beginning and was probably a key part of why we were you know, successful in landing the uh, this premier gig, right? I mean, Jeff had amazing experience hosting CTFs, amazing poner in his own right beyond just pl organizing CTFs, playing in CTFs, you know. Um, yeah, Jeff is, is very awesome. So we're really excited to have him here. Anything else to say about the starting of the order, gentlemen? So also, I did this all remotely because I wasn't in, in Phoenix. So I was just right. like throwing garbage LaTeX that probably didn't compile at people who were probably laughing at whatever was showing if up i was I laughing at you it's probably just because uh i couldn't uh <laughs> i was in deep in the whiskey and like was like who is this noob who doesn't know <laughs> it was it was quite a quite an interesting process it was just like 
it, and, and it was awesome because a lot of the proposals we write are very scientific, right? Yes. Um, so it's, you know, this is how we will um, uh, advance the state of the art of, of science. And science doesn't necessarily mean education, et cetera, et cetera. Right? I mean, right. There, there, right. there's overlap. But um, here we could really write about a topic that we were just passionate about um and which we also are with science but but here it's just you know how would you shape ctf right and then that's how we are and that was a very interesting experience for me personally yeah no no it was a great it's actually a well a little bit off topic but this is kind of the nice thing as an academic of writing proposals of research that you want to do actually really helps you force you to go through that you don't have to write an exact maybe research plan and have all the experiments done. And so it's very freeing to just say like, this is what I think would be very cool and future research I'd like to see done and here's why. Um, so those are the types of things that we definitely look for. So yeah, that, that was a great experience. And like Jan said, literally I'm, I'm fairly certain 95% of our proposal is in our philosophy. I think the only 5% is things that we redacted because we may want to may wanted to use them in the future of cool uh, either challenge ideas or themes around finals, those types of things. So yeah, so great. So that takes us to the past. And then now let's talk about the, the near term present. So we just survived DEF CON 28 CTF. DEF CON itself was in safe mode, was all virtual. And so our CTF was all virtual. So for that, continuing his theme of writing a series of DEF CON finals challenges. Jeff, do you know how many DEF CON finals challenges you've written so far and what the names are? Um, I think by now I'm up to like six. Whew. I don't remember the names of all of them. The first year I had some maybe that uh, were not really memorable, but um, last year I wrote um, one that was a, a, a chat app that was called Telegram. Mm hmm. With um, three O's. With three O's, of course. Of course. And um, this year I wrote one that was uh, it was called the Game Boy, also spelled with, with three O's. Three O's. And this was a uh, distributed Game Boy emulator where each of the like components of the emulator were uh, built as a microservice. So like you would have one microservice who implements the CPU and one microservice who implements the GPU and things like this. Awesome. So then what was the, okay, so then let, yeah, let's dive into this uh, challenge. So then what, what kind of inspired this challenge for you? Like, uh, you know, what, what from your things that you've seen did, was it vulnerability driven? Was it design of the challenge driven? Like what kind of, what kind of things, what gets Jeff going? So for this, it was more uh, design driven. Mm -hmm. Basically um, I came up with this idea for uh Building things as a with a with a firewall to block to block that like this would be how you would patch it. So mm -hmm. instead of patching the actual binary or um, patching particular files in it, you would actually have control over a of, of a firewall, mm -hmm. um, and that would would give you the ability to, um, to sort of do like a DPI on whatever attacks are being performed against parts of the system, mm -hmm. and be able to make a decision whether or not you want to let the traffic through. Cool. So that's like high level design, right? Yeah. So that's the uh, the high level goal you had in mind was kind of and was it like I don't know microservice oriented or just like this thought kind of came to you of like oh this would kind of be a cool challenge. Was it the the fact that patching is not uh, let's let's say straightforward like you said not just patching a binary but you have to actually understand the vulnerability enough to be able to write a what in essence is a firewall rule that blocks that, which then allows maybe other people ways around that. So the the reason for this was more, a lot of the time, if you've got old pieces of software or something, you might not know exactly how it works. And when mm -hmm. you're patching things, you patch it, but you don't know the extent of like what you're breaking. And this also makes it really hard for testing. So like if um, you're sending a patch, as organizers, we might not be exercising the full uh, the full extent of right. of the program. So we do our best when you when you submit a patch to verify whether or not you've broken functionality, but that's not always entirely possible. So cool. So this is actually a great maybe opportunity for us to briefly talk about how 
how do we come up with this kind of like patching approach for DEF CON uh, CTF? Because I think it's was a right. new thing we introduced in DEF CON 26 when we first yeah, hosted. Yeah, the, the, the front verification of, of patch deployment. Right, or maybe, and maybe Jan, you can talk about how it's done in the past and then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, traditionally in, in attack defense CTF in general and, and DEF CON um, CTF as part of that, uh, every team runs vulnerable services intentionally or unintentionally vulnerable um, and tries to exploit each other's services while protecting their own. Of course, it's very easy to protect a service, you know, ostensibly speaking, you just firewall it off completely or you just take it down, right? And you're Im immune. Turn off your vulnerable box and you're good to go. Yeah, they say that the most secure machine, right, is one that's like behind guards and unplugged and uh, not connected yeah. to the internet. Now exactly, but that's not very useful and that's not very uh, interesting. So of course, in the real world, you can't just bring your company or something offline. You have to uh, be up and providing some sort of service. Um, and in the corporate world, for those of us who have been there, there are these things called service level agreements, SLA. Mm -hmm. And you might say, okay, my SLA is that my service will be available 99.9999, whatever the five nines percent of the time. Well, CTF developed something similar, SLA checks. So mm -hmm. the organizers would create these um, checks, uh, check scripts that would connect to a team service and um, actually uh, try to make sure that the service is functioning properly. And uh, if a service isn't functioning properly, which means either the team brought it down or they uh, deployed a security patch that broke something, mm -hmm. then uh, that team would lose points, right? So this right. is uh, kind of the, the standard way things work. And, and uh, I'm sure that uh, both uh, you, Adam, and, and, and you, Jeff, know the huge pain that is uh, deploying an awesome patch and then watching your score start plummeting because uh, you fail an SLA check. And having the only real feedback is seeing, you know, closely monitoring that scoreboard to see if yeah. that little square goes from green to red. Exactly. And this and, is the next round, which is like a right. 10 minutes later. So. Exactly. Yep. And then you have to quickly revert everything so you can yeah. see if that, uh, that it, and then yeah. hope, hope that it goes back up to yeah. green the next round so that you don't lose those, those sweet, sweet defense yeah. points. And this may be just as a, this may actually then bring up Jeff's point of one of the reasons why attack defense is more difficult to run because you need these other types of checks for, let's say, even in this case, an SLA check, right? You, you have to develop the service and the SLA check, but so keep yeah, going. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's, um, I mean, it complicates attack defense quite a lot. Um, there were years where, um, at DEF CON CTF, as competitors, uh, we lost, you know, because of various chaos also on our side, mostly. Um, as competitors, we lost maybe a third of our points to uh, failed SLA checks, and it's very frustrating, right? Um, and so what we uh, decided to do as organizers was make, run those SLA checks up front. Right, the players submit, um, teams would submit their uh, patches and we would run our checks, mm -hmm. make sure that um, the patch is valid, that the um, service isn't broken now. And then we would roll the, the patch out. This requires a greater amount of control on our side. So we, we don't allow the teams to um, uh, replace their own uh, programs and so forth. We own their, their servers, uh, but it reduces uh, in, 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 in a lot of ways, um, this frustration of why, um, you know, is my SLA check or, or as we find moves, moves, moves the frustration, yeah. hopefully in a better way that reduces it overall. But exactly. of course it now introduces other issues of now you have this black box that, which before you still had the black box, but now in order to, uh, you know, release your patch, you can't even risk that you'll fail SLAs because we won't let you deploy the patch until it passes SLAs. That's uh, kind of one, one of the things that as organizers we uh, modified for for um, this. And, and Game Boy was actually special in patching, right? Yeah, so you could only patch uh, like a specific uh, firewall language, which was mm -hmm. a, like a JSON type uh, the best firewall language, the best language to write firewalls yeah. in. So it can only take YAML. 
So it's it's not like a, a dynamic patch. You would just have a specific um, JSON, which would either be comparing constants against arguments uh, or bytes in arguments or comparing uh, bytes against themselves. And you could compare equality, not equality, uh, greater than, less than. And um, if you submitted an invalid JSON, it would uh, it would fail open. So your firewall would be useless. So if you submit a, a broken JSON, um, I will accept your patch, but it, it's kind of worse than, than nothing because you don't really realize uh, what you're doing, I guess, which, which, which puts, puts uh, the onus on the, the players to, to test locally more. But. Yeah, and that, and that also has actually real world uh, you know, analogs, right? Like it, there are security systems like firewalls that will fail open. And so what do attackers do? They make it fail so that it fails open and now they don't have to bypass a firewall. So yeah, that's a, you know, not just a, a concept that you just conjured up out of thin air, right? You're bringing that in from industry and from real world um, situations. Cool. All right. So high level. Okay. So then that, that took us through the high level design of the system, right? So you wanted this system that had many different services and for all of that, for anything to happen, data or information had to go between systems, which would allow them to write this firewall. So how do we end up at a Game Boy? That's that's the, the big question for me. So I've always been a, a fan of emulators. Um, I've, I've written a few, but none of them have really been very good. But do we uh, do we need to dive into the psychology of why, or I guess we can ignore that for now and we can do ignore that this follow up. Now. Okay, great. <laughs> but um, the Game Boy is a relatively simple uh, simple machine to emulate. It's it's really well documented. Um, most of the, the stuff was cribbed from there's a JavaScript Game Boy emulator, um, and the guy who wrote this documented absolutely every opcode, nice. how the memory That's works, great. how everything works. Um, there's tons of examples of actually really performant Game Boy emulators, but I didn't really care about performance at all. Um, the goal of this was to sort of separate everything out and I've always been impressed with the architecture of how N64 emulators these days are, where you can swap out a different graphics plugins to support different games better, or um, a different input if you're using DirectX versus OpenGL mm -hmm. or something like this. So um, the idea behind this was to have a Game Boy, but you could swap out the CPU for a, a better one to support another game, or swap out the graphics stack to be something that would uh, upscale or something like this. Very cool. So what, what elements, what components did you have in the end? So at the end, there was a, uh, a ROM loader. Um, there were, Important. Um, so that way you would, you would pass in like a, a state of your Game Boy and a ROM, and it would fill out the memory for that. Hmm. Um, there was also the uh, input input module. So similar to like um, different input modules, you would, you would send the state of the Game Boy and what button you want to press and that would set uh, the um, memory map registers mm -hmm. for what buttons are being pressed. Um, there was a CPU, which you'd pass at the state. It would pass you back a new state based on the, the current contents of the memory and the current contents of the registers. And also there was a, uh, a GPU. And the GPU, similarly, you'd pass at the state and tell it to either render or to tick. Um, mm -hmm to set up the new memory or to render, it would send you back a bitmap of the, the current frame buffer that would get displayed if you were playing on a real Game Boy. So how, uh, how fast was all of this? Like, it, could you play a game using your emulator? Um, you could do maybe one or two frames per minute if you were doing, uh, if you were having it execute in the same way that a real Game Boy plays. Uh -huh. um, and this was local also. So when you're actually playing um, against other teams instances, you have the bottleneck of the network, and you also have the bottleneck of um, everything is being shut, shoved through an actual, like the actual firewall that performs inspection oh, on every every packet that goes the through. Beautiful JSON firewall. So it's it's a Ruby script that <laughs> that is uh, intercepting RPC lib and verifying that your uh, your arguments are not invalid according to the firewall rules. I suppose we can say the truth that you love Ruby like uh, Jan loves Python. It's a 
It's my favorite language of you all time. You don't have to defend it now. <laughs> Everyone to each their own, man. It's just, uh, you know, the best. I found it's the best language to write a um, Game Boy microservice firewall in. So. Exactly. At, I least, think it's at, the least, uh, at least you're not a bash uh, crazy person. I was going to say apologist, <laughs> but. <laughs> a bash apologist. I don't know, you know, if, if, if the language of your choice, you go up to the, the creator of it and, and you tell them how much you love the language and use it, and that's why. And that's bad. But yeah, at he least wrote Ruby's the ICTF registration form one year. The web page, the back end of the web page was that's a right. Bash script. Bash CGI. Bash is the best CGI handler. Yeah, <laughs> every, every year of the Boston Key Party was entirely done in Ruby with Sinatra and... Uh, SQLite databases, and after I, I, I've never been like a big web developer, but people went up to me and was like, "Why was why did you do SQLite after I released the code?" And I was like, "I don't know how to use a real database." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is a great example of like the hacker ethos and the CTF player ethos of like use whatever you know to, and make it work, man. Like, okay. yeah, if you ask me, I tell you you're crazy for doing it in SQLite, but you know what? You ran a big CTF. Do you remember how many people played either BKP or something? Um, like rough team estimates or something? Hundreds? I think it was on the order Thousands? of a thousand one year. Yeah. Um, I can check CPF time for the actual scoreboard. But... Yeah, that's super impressive, right? I mean, that's, you know, you're running all this and, you know, oftentimes we don't need all this complicated stuff if you can do whatever works. Or like Jan said, if, if you're going to solve a challenge and write the world's ugliest bash script at the end of the day, if you get that flag, it don't matter what the language yeah. was. Except it yeah. was so it was it was on the order of a thousand. Um, yeah, for twenty seventeen. So and, that's great, uh, man. People can try to clown you all they want, but like, hey, did you run a CTF with a thousand people? No. Then you can choose whatever uh, database backend you want, but just don't let it be SQLite. <laughs> you can have it be SQLite. You just have to be really careful about concurrency. Yeah, that's what's gonna kill you. That's, that, that's... But CTF doesn't have that much stuff, and that's why Jan keeps trying to convince us. He tried to convince us the first year to not use a database for those quals, right? Just yeah. file system. Use a file system. What do you need a database for? <laughs> LS is your query language and grep is beautiful. And it did not that did not survive. That plan did not survive. The contact with me. <laughs> First version of phone college was like that. In it on file database. It was and that's great. why and it is no longer. It is that's right. So, somehow we lost lost our uh, the right way. Somehow. Lost the way. Cool. Okay, so Jeff, you took I think this is actually super interesting for people to think about. So you took this concept of this like microservice message passing based architecture and you've just freaking took a Game Boy and you slammed those two together and made it work in a way that's like frankly scary as somebody who knows you because that's that's kind of insane in a good way, right? It's like you just took this concept and you're like, you almost have to sit there and be like, but what if the system was a Game Boy? Which doesn't make sense. But like that, but you made it, mashed it together and made it work in a way that actually captures the design goal that you wanted to do. It was probably insane in a good way from the player's perspective, but once they kind of understood what was going on, right? You have all these components that you can analyze in isolation based on what inputs and outputs they give, right? So that's actually super useful for the teams. You could even split um, that behavior up amongst the teams. Plus, you got rid of this, like, just patching out a vulnerability by forcing them to do this firewall-based stuff. I mean, this is a super cool challenge, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I was more proud of is the fact that um, in its own, if, if you did, weren't given the firewall to begin with, mm -hmm. it becomes sort of like a ridiculous uh, intercepting the traffic, trying to reverse engineer how things work and whatever. But... When you're given this this firewall proxy whatever um and it's when you see the ruby code you can understand mm -hmm. it's a message pack based um if based. you understand the ruby code but yeah that's that's a fascinating um example right you you actually deliberately gave them information that would help them so they didn't have to reverse engineer anything from the ground up which could be a lesson that i could use in the future but yeah so so once they see that like okay it's being it, it's rpc via message pack um Here's, a, here's basically a free debugger for like what you give it and what comes back. You can intercept it and inspect the data, see what's happening. That's really interesting, the debugging functionality being built into the service 
as part of its normal operation. Right, which is always this, I think we naturally have this kind of push, right, to say, like, okay, it's DEF CON CTF. It should be as hard as possible, right? Like, do they get the self-documenting firewall? No, they have to reverse engineer it from the firewall rules. So can you, can you talk about what led you to that decision? Because I think that would help people when thinking about, you know, future organizers or future us. Yeah, just to avoid confusion, they did get the, the firewall, but it, they did. It, there but could have been a world in which they didn't, yeah. right? There could be a parallel universe or something that Jeff decided not to do that or that somebody convinced him not to do that because, you know, these are the best hackers on the world. Why can't they reverse engineer that part? So can you talk about your, your process? Yeah, so I, I think I come into it with two thoughts. On, on the one end, I think compile with O3, strip the binary. I don't, I, I don't care. You, you, I spent all my time building this. You should spend equal amount of time reversing it. Right. But on the other end, it's like, what am I trying to uh, select for? Like, who mm -hmm. do you who do you want to be able to solve this challenge? Somebody who is just like an elite reverse engineer who can take a optimized code with without knowing like what's going on and make sense of it, or do I want to select more for someone who is a competent reverse engineer, but also uh, can write an exploit or something like this. So it's yeah. it's sort of like there are so many specialized skills that you don't want to only select for, for one of them when, mm -hmm. when you're creating something like this. And it may be, I don't know if you thought about this, but it definitely impacts the, let's say, the gameplay aspect. So if it's easier to find the bug than it is to write the firewall and the patch, right? If writing the firewall and the patch takes a lot of reverse engineering effort beyond what it takes to find the bug, then you can end up in this case where everybody's just poning each other and they don't really know how to even prevent that. And that could be an insanely frustrating situation, right? Yeah, I, it, it's, it's, really, it's really hard to give challenges that you can sort of have this cat and mouse game between people patching and and exploiting like you want patching to be maybe a little bit easier than it is to exploit mm -hmm. because it's it's no fun being that team that is just getting destroyed the entire game because you're slow at patching right. <laughs> you, you like, went on a hike like uh, i don't know what that's like we've never we've never experienced this point of, yes, of course but, theoretically um, theoretically you're saying but but I, when... I, I you know i once heard of a case where <laughs> Uh, there was one team at, at DEF CON maybe, I don't know, five, six years ago that um, was uh, just getting owned on something. And, and someone finally decided to put them out of their misery and just like a different team, uh, someone from a different team walked up to them and said, listen, guys, you're the only ones vulnerable on this service. I'm just, the vulnerability is in this function. Please just fix it so we can be done with this service already. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so like it, it's... It's more fun when you have a bunch of vulnerabilities, but it's not impossible for the worst team to patch it because you don't you don't want something to be just leaking flags out of something trivial the entire time. Right. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's uh, super helpful. Okay, so we had the high level description. You talked about the different modules that you had. The big question that I have is, could you play Tetris on your emulator? Uh, how much time do you do you have to play it? <laughs> It, I mean, it, infinite it, time. I'm really good at Tetris. Given infinite time, everything was functional. Um, if you had used the client that I provided, Tetris would, would run. Um, Tetris was one of the few games that actually ran. There was a bug that prevented Dr. Mario from rendering. No. Oh, um, most of the demos that only used one ROM bank worked. I didn't, I didn't ever have multiple banks because the JavaScript emulator that I was reading <laughs> didn't support multiple banks. So There you go. It's uh, limitations of your current approach. Uh, yeah, that's great. Okay, then, so that's the design phase. So then take us through DEF CON 28 CTF. So when did we launch Game Boy and how did that go? I don't remember which day it was, but <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was in this sort shift, of eight shift hours. Shift, it was the start, shift of, three, yeah. start of shift three. I think we had intended to release it the shift before that, but yeah. There was an unfortunate situation where the <laughs> phones being on silent and yes the, the yeah but in shift three everyone was well rested and ready to release yes by game. shift three everything was ready to go and it's not that it wasn't ready by shift two it was just uh 
And due to the you know pandemic situation, us being all remote, we couldn't go over and shake somebody to wake them up when. They... Oh yeah, we have a, and, and this happens, right? Yeah. Like um, in, um, I think it was last year where uh, we pulled someone. We all gathered in one house for mm-hmm. for qual specifically, um, and uh, at one point we pulled someone out of bed. And you know, as their brain is rebooting, trying to they're like put a laptop in their hand, so <laughs> launch it, go. Yes, we need to launch your challenge now. Go. <laughs> so we couldn't do that. That's the way it was. It's fine. We launched it. Shift three. How did it go? Um, so it was initially launched with um, the the intended bug was in the um, the input input module, which was basically a, a hardware backdoor. And uh, I, I know we get a lot of the talk about, like, there were a lot of challenges with backdoors, but... Um, well, I, I think it's it's something that we can uh, chat about here, right? Because you, you said initially it launched with this intended vulnerability. This challenge, um, my understanding, is one of the, the visions um, behind it was that you could swap out these plugins throughout yeah. the course of the game, right? So it's specifically designed to handle that situation, right? Where you could say, release different versions with different configurations of these plugins. Yeah. Yeah, so for this um, hardware backdoor plugin, the idea for this one was um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a specialized hardware that if you can put in some sort of commands that on a normal Game Boy are impossible, um, then a, a special series of them will actually uh, just spit out the flag. So if you look at the code, it, it wasn't very hard to find out, okay, if I put in something, it spits out a flag. But um, the, the idea here is that you can write a firewall rule that blocks it and will never fail SLA because SLA checks would only... I mean, this, this wasn't explicitly explained to players, but the idea is um, some, of the, some of the inputs in the uh, magical backdoor are actually commands that on a real Game Boy are impossible. Like you, on a on a real D-pad, you cannot hit up and down at the same time. The, the, the like the button physically won't press that way. Which makes sense, right? In terms of like that actually could be a developer. You know, it doesn't need to be like a malicious backdoor. That could be a developer mm-hmm. debug thing that they can only do on their debug platform. And they know that when this is released, nobody will ever be able to use it. So why remove it? Yeah. And this was was live for several hours um, before before the it was reversed and started to be exploited. And I think maybe there were four teams that were. We had a threshold of something like two hundred flags before we would remove that and and move. And that was something I think we learned in uh, you know throughout from this last CTF from your Mm -hmm. challenge and my challenge was basically one of the things when we commit to having, let's say the top team can score 600 flags on a challenge before it's retired. uh, We now have a better understanding of how that interacts with challenges with multiple phases and multiple bugs that we want to patch out. And so probably something, you know, to think about for the future is do we pre-commit to that and tell the teams, Hey, this is phase one. When there's 200 flags stolen, we will release phase two. That will last for X amount of flags, and then you know, you know, pre-commit to these stages. I think that would be make for a super interesting game that mixes um, because before we didn't have this hard flag cap limit, so we could kind of decide how much we felt was playable in the services. But then, uh, what's the downside of that, Jan? The, the downside is their runaway effects, right? So if um, one team identifies this back door and uh, they start exploiting and no other team figures out how to patch that, um, a team could win the game by finding one backdoor in one service. Um, and, and there are arguments to be made then that maybe they should win the game because they're the only ones to find it. There are other arguments to be made that um, there should be incentive to look deeper, right? And so this is a balance of sort of pre-commit um, that we did finally with Game Boy, we, we announced ahead of time that at 200 flags, phase two would launch. Um, it's a balance, right? They know they will be rewarded some very specific amount, but the service can still continue to, to dive in deeper. Right, and then they know they can invest time into while the challenge is currently going and that this isn't gonna be the only thing and it might go away. 
Or I guess they can always gamble and just think, well, they got lucky and found the phase two bug. <laughs> and so... Yeah, and so then they get all 400, right? Right. Or whatever. Cool. Okay, so then, you know, 200-something flags, we released phase two. So what then was phase two about for Game Boy? So phase two was it was like a hardware revision just in the just in the input. So um, the input just basically had the spit out flag part commented out and recompiled and when you see it you see okay that's gone so i i I hope nobody continued to look at that and think like oh i i I think there's another way for it but right and and that's actually a really interesting now bringing it back to the design of your challenge right so now the only thing that changed was one out of was it three or four components yeah so all of the time that they all spent you know reversing and understanding those other components was not time wasted right Right. So, so the the idea here is that all while the challenge is live, sort of any information that you gain about the architecture or how anything works, it it's never useless. Um, like, if you know what the Game Boy struck uh, for the state that gets passed between them, it's always helpful. Um, if you if you know what it looks like when you're passing it here, you'll know what it looks like when you're passing it to a different to a different endpoint. Um, so the second part was. Um, the second intended bug was um, a raise condition in the GPU process. So basically, the GPU would contain um, like a, a like a scan line counter, and that was something that was stateful. Well, the rest of it is mostly stateless. Mm. Um, unfortunately, when it was first deployed, there was a a bug um, that was uh, improperly tested on my machine versus the one that it was compiled and released on. Um, that made a raise condition unwinnable. So, like that—that that was unfortunate for a while before. And and this is actually um, one of the things that um, these multi-phase challenges. Uh, it, it, each phase requires as much testing as a challenge, right? And so right. It, it's it's very easy to under um, to underplan basically the the time required to test all of these. It's a bug. It happens. Like we all, yeah. you know. We all make mistakes. We can all do better on next challenges, all that stuff. So, and I think what's important is actually exactly what you're doing now is, you know, talking about what happens so that other people in the future can like learn from that, right? About how, you know, what happened and that, you know, the world didn't end. It was unfortunate. We wish it didn't happen, but hey, you know, it's a CTF. It's fine. Uh, we made some changes and yeah. But yeah, so for that second stage, it was a few hours and I think like, I think somebody should be having this by now. And then I, I started like digging in a little deeper, looking at this and like, huh, this, <laughs> this check got optimized out. Oh shit. Um, so the curse after of the that, source. yeah, after this, like, um, I, I played with it a little bit and then I, I changed uh, compiler flags and, and a few other things. And I, I got it back to be exploitable and we released it. Um, I understand that some players may find that a little bit frustrating, but yeah. I mean, I, we did the best that we can to, to to make sure that your time isn't wasted. You'll still understand what happened, and mm-hmm. in any case, it sort of more points you at where the where the vulnerability must be because this was the only part that was changed. And if you right. see like if you diff the two functions, like it, it it should help you. Unfortunately, nobody was able to solve it by the end, and I think two teams had working exploits like 20 minutes after yeah which, yeah it's which like break. ctf <laughs> that's, that's we've all of, been there i yeah. there was um there was one ctf uh secu inside i think it was that had 1000 point problems it was jeopardy style and you know normally um a non-dynamic jeopardy uh will go up to you know from 100 to 500 points for mm-hmm. challenges they had 1000 point challenges i spent 49 hours on one of those challenges the CTF was 48 hours long. Oh, CTF. I solved it, and it, it, but you know, which helped you as a player. It sucks that yeah. it doesn't help as a team. Uh, you know, your team yeah. win or whatever. But at the end of the day, I mean, you know, if you look inside, we're doing this to get better and learn and develop. And yeah, so yeah, no, I think it it, it shook out the way it shook out, and you know, we can just learn from it and move forward, man. Yeah, and for this one also. Um, the another idea for the like how you would block it with the firewall rule mm-hmm. is um, with this you'd get an out of bounds write um, from 
from the stack because that's where like uh, the, the the memory was. Mm -hmm. So um, what you would actually be writing would be the contents of like the sprite buffers, and those should only be like three specific colors on an original Game Boy. Those should mm -hmm. uh, have like some sort of grayscale where it doesn't have very many colors. Mm -hmm. um, and these were were like uh, RGB colors. So um, if you were to be playing defensively, you could uh, scan the entirety. I, I gave a, a, a very large amount of uh, bytes that you're allowed to check on the on the GPU process. So you would be able to scan the entire uh, uh, GPU memory and validate that everything was a valid uh, Game Boy color to be, oh. to be drawn. So hmm. that's super cool. So the defense, um, so the exploitation of the of the first phase, that input. Uh, hardware backdoor and the defense of the second phase both require knowledge of the Game Boy. Yeah, so it's it's sort of like uh, neat. if you know how the platform works, you have a, a bit of a leg up. Mm. Um, otherwise, you're you're in for a little bit more reversing. But I think if you download any sort of test ROM or anything, you'll see what the memory looks like and, and maybe understand. Okay, these are these are the only valid mm -hmm. um, colors that you can display. I should check for those. Other, otherwise, patching is hard. But for that one, patching was sort of intended to be a little bit harder. The amount of bytes that you were allowed to check sort of was to hint you at you can scan the whole memory. But maybe it, it's uh, it's the kind of thing where you you might have to be thinking on the same path that the challenge designer is thinking. Right. But which is, which you know brings up a, a super interesting point is that uh, oh the the point that you brought up you know it's just a, an unfortunate thing that's hard to control for of how much prior knowledge a a player could come in and have an advantage on a certain challenge right it's like yeah if if one of the people who wrote one of these game boy emulators was on one of these teams yeah you're going to have an advantage right that's not something that you as the challenge author can always anticipate or understand and it works always for all kinds of you know challenges. So. I think, uh, and we'll probably talk about this challenge in a later episode. But uh, last year we ran a challenge on Xbox hardware, so we gave out a bunch of Xboxes uh, one to every team, and we ran Doom. Um, and the challenge was the King of the Hill, where you had to literally hold uh, some some area in in the network right. game um, through you know cheats and so forth. Uh, someone turned out to be like a semi-pro Doom player on one of the teams. <laughs> and I think all they did was play Doom, and they, they yeah, did it turns out you could get a lot of flags of and a lot of points. Challenge. How could we, you know, what can you do? By just killing people in Doom, just like being a really good Doom player. And it's like, yeah. oh yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense. But, but you know, in our, you know, looking back, you still even to get to the point where you could play Doom and shoot people, you had to yes. um, take advantage of vulnerabilities. Do thing and so forth, yeah. Exactly, which is, yeah, I think that's, you know, means that they didn't just sit down and play doom i mean they ended up doing that to get points and like hey if you got a person on your team like that that's great so yeah that's awesome cool is there anything else about your challenge you want to mention jeff i think that covers most of it i mean there were there were other components that didn't end up getting released um right they, they probably they probably won't get released at this point uh <laughs> that's good we can kill them now it's it's fair but yeah that's kind of the interesting you know having this modular design allowed you to release different configurations and different components um, to either introduce new bugs or introduce new components and introduce maybe new complex interactions so uh, yeah it's a very ambitious um, you know challenge design yeah I, I, I hope that we see something similar to the the firewall type patching mm -hmm. in the future with with other CTFs it's it's something where first of all I think attack defense is rare enough that you don't see a whole lot of changes to challenge yeah. styles. Right. The The one that it made me think of was uh, Hitcon CTF. That was the capture the food CTF. So I don't remember the exact year. I just remember you were not starving. getting any food because Shellfish was doing <laughs> not well that year. Um, and yeah, I went to Taiwan and the web challenge was super cool. It was an incredibly vulnerable PHP application that had tons of vulnerabilities. And the defense, the patching was upload a C file that gets compiled and the HTTP request passes into your C file. And then you get a return zero or one if you want to allow it or block it. 
So this was super cool because you had to write, you know, I spent that night writing a really bad uh, HTTP parser that um, I think ended up being very crappy and not being useful and broke our service the next morning. Um, so I mainly focused that CTF on attacks. So I came up with cool workarounds of other people's because the other cool thing is, because it was open patching, you got to see their binary patches that you could then download and look at. And because you uploaded a C file, they couldn't optimize stuff out too crazy. So, you know, those were easy to disassemble. And because of that CTF was open patching and you could trivially through the web interface steal somebody else's patch, there was a lot of backdoor action going on too. So you could reverse engineer people's backdoor from those patches. It was a very cool service that had a similar flavor uh, to the Game Boy service. Yeah, so maybe that's a interesting thing for the, the community to think about of how do we design challenges where patching isn't exactly patching, right? That it's something, you know, it's more trying to capture the maliciousness in some way in, in the sense that a firewall does. On, on a more kind of a uh, uh, high level con like from a more high level view mm -hmm. it's interesting that you saw a similar design in a web challenge mm -hmm. and in a uh, binary pwnable right I wonder you know where can you mix and match other design concepts can you have some sort of a you know what came to mind is like can you have a crazy social network recon component that is required to patch a binary challenge somehow i have no idea this just popped in my head but a taxonomy of of um or maybe a genome of ctf challenges would be an interesting thing to the to dangerous thing i will say right now of us doing this podcast at all is the fact that i'm slightly worried that anything we say is going to be over analyzed by people that's to right exactly like, oh or, next year they're gonna have yeah recon challenges exactly play. or the worst case is i actually have a good idea or you guys have good ideas that we want to use but we're like oh we just told everybody about that so then we have to seed bad ideas that we're not going to use it was exactly. like last year you remember uh jeff it was because of you that we had to tell people to make sure they had like a mac uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Beforehand, but we didn't want to tell to them we're going to be oh, yeah, poning yeah. iOS software. So we said like 10 or 20 operating systems that they had to do <laughs> so that they would be prepared, but not know exactly what was going to yeah. happen. Was not like BOS on the list or something? Probably. Or something that I had never, never yeah, even run in VM. I anything. think I just, I just like, let's see some random uh, operating system so that we could throw them off the scent of a iOS challenge. Sounds like something I would do, man. So oh, yeah, but insane. yeah, you're right. I mean, those are the, you know, I think it, it's it's probably better if other people think about these kinds of things. But yeah, you're right of like, how do you take different design decisions? And it, and that specific challenge for the Hitcon one, to me, it made a lot of sense because the vulnerabilities in the web app were trivial and easy to patch. It was not a complicated web application. So, you know, that that is one of the things that we talked with with Alex about patching web applications is incredibly mm -hmm. difficult because it's not like a binary necessarily where there's you can pretty easily if you can edit the source, you can really patch that baby out. So, um, yeah, no, I think it's fascinating to think about those those options and I guess gear up your recon engines for Absolutely. next year. Uh, cool. Anything you want to share with uh, maybe future organizers, future players, Jeff, uh, lessons learned either about this or in general, you know, this is the time to share your infinite wisdom and knowledge i mean it's it's really easy to get started now than it was um back like in 2013 or whatever um mostly because there's a lot of like can scoreboards and things like that um hosting a challenge like, there's like example docker files and everything that um going from writing a challenge to deploying it to hosting a ctf is is I don't want to say it's trivial because it's still a ridiculous amount of work, but yes. a, a lot of the boilerplate is done for you. Like back when I started, um, you had to walk up uphill to the challenge. There was there was almost no uh, no example of where to start. So like I wrote a scoreboard from scratch in <laughs> in Ruby. We wrote um, the scoreboard from scratch for ICTF every year. 
literally every year. Actually, until I got involved, we rewrote the entire infrastructure every single year. Every it wasn't year. until one of the years that I did, I was like, no, no, we're going to make like restful interfaces so we can reuse these components instead of building them from scratch every year. But go ahead. Right, Jeff. but now, now most people don't have to. Yeah. Right. We do because we're some sort of masochist or something. Well, it's a separate <laughs> issue. We'll but, talk about that later. We may have an infrastructure podcast in the future. But, that would be but most people, they can just download CTFD and it's, yeah. it's amazing. It's a uh, turnkey and you have something that works. Um, you can also have something like that, that just spawns your challenges in Docker containers and you just write a, a ponable. Um, in the past, I had written some horrendous Ruby scripts that would set up a Debian root and run them and just like, hope that nobody can escape the truth because amazing or they don't care once they got the flag yeah like <laughs> yeah so like it things have gotten so much so much different than it was just uh, seven years ago that it's it's like kind of commoditized running it and it, it means that really anyone can get started which is probably one of the reasons i mean you you see a ctf every weekend now um i mm -hmm. just uh introduced a new mode of extra credit to my course um it's when we're as we're recording it the semester um has started the fall semester and in my course now i give people an extra credit for every ct one point for every ctf that they participate in and you this is significant because there's so many ctfs because of what you said right you know every weekend there are there's at least one that's great cool so yeah ctf is out there uh that's a great point, Jeff. We've actually tried to make the point in the past of getting people into CTFs to play, but I think you bring up an amazing point about, hey, you can organize your own CTFs too. And it doesn't, the other thing is it doesn't always, you know, especially when you're starting out, you don't have to launch this big global CTF. You can make a CTF for your friends, for your local hacking group, for, you know, just to get better, share some cool thing that you learned. You're like Linux users group if you go to, to yeah. those, those sort of groups. Um, but Jeff, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, what is your next, uh, you know, bakery steps? When are we going to get more bread from your, you know? So that's kind of been uh, deleted due to bread thievery, but uh, <laughs> nice. I mean, he's a, uh, Jeff's a very secret person, man. You can't squeeze info out of him. You know, he's, uh, uh, he, he holds his bread <laughs> close to his heart, close to his vest. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, great. Um, yeah, Jeff, thanks so much for being on today. Do you have anything you want to plug? Anything that people can reach you on the socials or the internet or anything? Um, I don't have any social media. Um, there you go. Uh, then, yeah, tough. I don't know. Yeah. You want to talk to Jeff, talk to us, and we'll maybe try to put you in contact with him. Yeah. So, thanks for uh, joining us today, everyone. I'm Adam D, and you can find me on Twitter at Adam Dupay. Uh, he's Zardis. You can find him on Twitter at Zardis. We're CTF Radio, and you can find us online on YouTube and Twitter at CTF Radio with O's, not zeros. Uh, you can send questions to us through email at ctfradio at gmail.com, again with three O's. And who knows, your questions may end up on a future episode. So take care and happy hacking, everyone. Goodbye, hackers. Thank you.